Okay, well, those are the big headlines at this hour. Now, let's welcome on the show Ashish Shankar, the Deputy MD of Motilal Oswal Private Wealth Management. Ashish, thank you so much for joining us today on ET Now. You know, the entire idea behind this conversation really is to um, sort of uh, solve this dilemma of sorts that the FM has put forward, especially for those individuals who are in the high salary category. Uh, you know, these are the, usually the people who... Uh, you know the provident fund you lips is said etc give a good tax umbrella it's a great tool really to manage your taxes uh, a provident fund comes in the exempt 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 category you lips as well give you tax exemption and deductions now of course the fm has um, you know capped the amount of exemption you may get so if you put more than two and a half lakh rupees into your provident fund in a year the interest on that excess amount is going to be taxable but you know the question is over here ashish that we enjoy eight and a half percent interest on provident fund at least that was the rate of return yes. notified last year it may be lower going forward given the fact that you know the interest rate environment is not that great um would you read into this this change in tax as a bit of a big bummer do you think that net of taxes the return uh, may be quite low for some of these people yeah Mubina, first of all pleasure to be on your show i hope i can add value to your viewers uh, so coming to EPF, see, look at it this way, 8.5% tax-free return is a fantastic return today, any which way you look at it, because, uh, you know, rates on fixed deposits have dropped and uh, many people cannot stomach the volatility of equities. So in a sense, this was a government subsidy given to salaried employees, right? So what the government is essentially doing is by reducing it to 2.5 lakhs, so they are saying that, you know, we'll still continue to subsidize uh, returns for the low income earners, but people who have high incomes, right, they, they, they should be going out there and buying market linked products and we will not be offering that subsidy any longer. So that's what they have done. That's the way to look at it. Now, why didn't they completely do away with it? Because at the end of the day, EPF and a lot of these small saving schemes are also a big source of uh, receipts for the government. And they do borrow apart from, you know, the government securities market, they do borrow through these, uh, schemes as well so it's it's a subsidy that all of us were enjoying for a very long time which has gone away uh, uh, and then that, that's how one should look at it but obviously like you said it puts uh, additional responsibility on advisors and it puts uh, you know pressure on investors to try and understand some of the market options and then you know accordingly plan for their retirement or any other goals uh, that they have uh, and similarly for ULIP, uh, you know now that the amount of uh, has been capped at two and a half lakhs, it just brings ULIPs at par with mutual funds. See, mutual funds have always been subject to tax, uh, depending on the scheme you invest in, the time horizon is different, but it's subject to capital gains and marginal tax. And ULIP was enjoying a tax holiday so far. So that anomaly uh, has, been, has been done away. Yeah, understandably, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, what the FM's point of view as well is over here. Um, what do you think of the national pension scheme? Uh, it's relatively newer, um, you know, it's just about, I think, eight to ten years ago, if I'm not mistaken, that it was introduced. And I have a report over here that says on an annualized basis, it has given, you know, seven, eight, nine percent returns. If we have to look at it as an average on all the categories, alternative assets, uh, guilt funds, uh, sorry, guilt securities, debt securities, that's essentially the categories that, uh, you know, the NPS offers investors to pick and choose from. Uh, do you think that that's, you know, a good alternative? Because again, it gives you that, that tax umbrella. You have to pay tax only at retirement. Yes. So, uh, see, in a sense, NPS is also a market-linked uh, product. Uh, what happens in NPS is that to an extent, you get tax exemption whilst to invest. Uh, some part of the tax exemption gets subsumed in ATC up to one and a half lakhs. There is an additional 50,000 which is given. So my view is that, you know, uh, till the extent of ATC or the additional exemption given of ATCCD, one should definitely look at look at the NPS. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, remember that NPF, NPS is also a market link product managed by about six uh, asset managers. So you can choose your asset manager. So there are two, two kinds of products in NPS. One is an auto product, which basically designs the asset allocation uh, uh, given your age. So for example, if you're less than 35 years of age, 
the uh, allocation is more aggressive where 75% goes to equity type of schemes and as you progress uh, you know in your age uh, it goes to the moderate profile and then it goes to conservative where the equity portion reduces to below 25 so that's the auto option second you know uh, it gives you the option to do it yourself that is the active option right so either which way is uh, mobina i think uh, once you've done the tax exemption between atc and atccd uh, you have to look at other instruments like mutual funds so consider nps like a mutual fund but uh, the advantage of nps is a you have an auto option where you don't have to think how to balance your portfolio depending on your age so that's the big benefit there second costs are much cheaper and third there is also uh, an employer contribution which kicks in there but even if you are doing nps and choosing that as your longer term retirement vehicle you definitely have to spend time to understand the underlying products the underlying asset classes and then choose the manager which you like so whilst you quoted average returns the return of an individual from an nps can be very different depending on either the choice of underlying option or if you give the auto option then depending on your age the allocation will differ so if you are below 35 it will be 75% equities so the volatility will be much higher and the returns will be very very different so i think it's important to look at nps as an option for saving for goals or reti- for retirement but at the end of the day one also has to spend time understanding these options Hmm. Yeah, uh, that's absolutely true. So, um, you know, I, I mean, I, I would be making an assumption over here, but uh, I guess it would be a fair one if I say that most of these individuals who have a high amount of salary, uh, and that essentially means that more corpus is well to park, they would probably be uh, maybe about fifty. So they have maybe ten odd years left to their retirement. So based on all these developments, how do you think that they should spread their retirement corpus across different asset classes, given the fact that they'll probably be having ten, twelve odd years to retirement? Right. So there are two things which are uh, important here, uh, Mubina. One is. uh you know obviously how many years do you have to retirement that is how many years will your cash flows continue second thing is what is the absolute corpus that you have collected and uh you know what is the retirement expenses uh, per month now either one can do it uh, oneself you know on an excel sheet or you know you can do basic maths or you know you can you can go through an advisor now in terms of allocation right the thumb rule is that as you near retirement and your cash flows start uh, you know there is a cut off date after which you retire and you know you no longer get regular cash flows you should start getting more conservative on your corpus so broadly you know to keep it very simple for your viewers you know there are three basic allocations the thumb rule one is the 30 70 where you have 30 debt and 70 equity the second is 50 50 50 equity 50 debt the third is 70 debt 30 equity now generally i i believe that you know in your early years of your of your career you should choose the 70 equity 30 debt option so between the age of let's say 22 to 35 right you could choose the 70 30 kind of an option between 35 and let's say uh, you know 55 you could choose the 50 50 and as you close uh, you know are closer to your retirement age you should become 70 80 debt and 20 20 equity now 90% of your outcome you know how much corpus you will have and you know what kind of uh, goals you will have will get determined by how you allocate your money between these two fundamental asset classes i'm assuming you've done your insurance and you've kept your emergency funds aside in a bank or in a cash fund right i'm only talking about the investment uh, corpus so as you go into retirement i think the 70 75% debt allocation 20 to 25 30% equity allocation is a good allocation to have and then after you've retired you can then plan the withdrawals from that corpus now the investment can happen some across nps definitely that 2 and 1/2 lakh full limit you should utilize in epf and then after that i believe you mutual funds offer you a fantastic platform to plan your portfolios to meet the retirement corpus as well as then to re- then to withdraw they have something called an swp systematic withdrawal option and it becomes very tax efficient because by then most of your funds are long are are, are eligible for long term capital gains
Okay. All right. Well, we'll take this conversation forward. And in the meantime, of course, I'll ask all our viewers as well, if you have any questions on the topics that we've discussed so far with, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with uh, Ashish, you can just send them in to us uh, on the money show at etnow.tv. For now, we'll take a very short break and be right back. Show on ET now. Well, uh, let's take on board some questions and queries. Then we've received uh, for Ashish quite a few of them. Actually, you don't know how much time we'll have uh, to take all of them, but uh, we'll try our best, um, uh, you know, to squeeze in those questions for you, Ashish. Um, uh, all of them, of course, on this topic uh, uh, that we are speaking about. Our first question is from Sabu Isaac. He says, I am on the verge of retirement. How should I invest my corpus of 80 lakh rupees, which he must have accumulated, of course, during his you know, course of working and service? He says, I wish to keep exposure to equities very minimum as I have a moderate risk appetite. My yearly expense is about 7 lakh rupees currently. Kindly advise. So he's not got... I think he's got no investments actually Ashish, he's just accumulated this corpus of 80 lakh rupees and now he's approaching retirement. So do you think that having a moderate risk appetite makes sense for him or do you think it's okay for him to be a bit more bold because you know he's, I mean he must be probably in his late 50s or early 60s, what would you recommend? See, uh, I think the first thing to understand is how much does your corpus need to sweat to meet your expenses, right? So at 80 lakhs and he wants uh, 7 lakhs of uh, income every year, which is roughly 9% at a portfolio level. Okay. Now first let's understand base rates. Today, if you put money in high quality debt products, right, you will get somewhere between 6 and 6.5%. All right. So putting the entire corpus in debt is definitely not an option. He will not achieve his goal of 7 lakhs. Either he reduces his expensive expenses if he wants to uh, keep keep the portfolio conservative, right? which I'm not sure is a, whether it, it is a choice. But if that's not a choice and he wants his asset to sweat more, uh, then he will definitely have to increase his risk in the portfolio and go towards equities. So broadly, I think, you know, uh, uh, kind of a 70-30 portfolio, right, should do it for him. So you have 70 in fixed income, 30 in equities, because remember one thing, uh, you know, after retirement, people only look at how much they need for that particular year. So he said 7 lakhs. Now, that 7 lakhs is not going to remain 7 lakhs five, year, five years down the line. There is something called inflation, which keeps inflating your costs every year. So he needs to have some portion of his portfolio in assets that can grow his corpus. I mean, if he withdraws the entire 7 lakhs and his corpus is at the same level, he won't account for inflation. So I think, a, you know, 65, 70 kind of a fixed income portfolio and 30, 35 equity portfolio should, should be fine for him. Uh, ideally, I would uh, say that, you know, I would have preferred the corpus being larger or, you know, somewhere he moderate his expenses for some time and then so that you know he, he becomes even more comfortable but at this purpose i would say a 65 35 70 30 kind of a portfolio should should broadly work for him and again i'm just mentioning the same line that he should consult consult an advisor who can structure this for him Yes, absolutely. I mean, this is just to give you a broad skeleton of the direction that you could head. It always makes sense to consult your advisor. But 65, 35 kind of portfolio is okay. And always keep in mind that today you may be spending 7 lakh rupees per annum. Uh, six, seven years later, keeping in mind inflation, uh, this amount may be higher. Okay, uh, very quickly, let's take on board our next question. <coughs> Excuse me. Shivaji Pednekar says, how should one plan investments after retirement? All of my money is in my federal bank savings account and I have a few investments in equity. So I'm assuming he must be having few shares that may, he may have purchased and, you know, kept with himself. Uh, but everything is in a savings account um you know and actually ashish this is something that i think a lot of uh, individuals forget that yes retirement is the goal but even after you retire financial planning has to go on you have to keep looking at how your investments are doing where you're allocating your assets and i think in that sense shivaji has asked a good question but of course where he's gone wrong is parking all of his money in a savings account so what would you recommend Absolutely. So first thing is, uh, you know, savings account returns are abysmal. I mean, we know that it's between two and a half to four percent and it's been dropping every year given the kind of low interest rates that we're witnessing in the country. Now, there are many uh, 
you know parts to this puzzle that i don't know which is how much is the total corpus what is his expenses per annum but i think my answer will be similar to your earlier uh, you know you were who had who had called in that he needs to first figure out how much is his expenses every year now in relation to the corpus that he has got what is the base rate of return he needs to achieve to generate that 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 expense every month right now that that return uh, cannot be uh, you know higher than what the markets can generate and i'll give you a broad broad sketch uh, let's say you have a corpus of 100 rupees right and your expenses are 15 rupees every year then the entire thing needs to be in equity Uh, to generate that 15 which is just not practical and feasible because equity portfolios are very very volatile and you know when you're in your retirement you don't want a situation that you can't spend you you don't have money for your monthly expenses when markets are uh, down right so you cannot budget for a 15% kind of a return on your retirement corpus at the same time putting 100% in in fixed income investments or very conservative let's say federal bank you know savings bank account he said 100 rupees if you put you only get 3 rupees right so that is also not practical so i think a mix or judicious mix of funds which can generate you know 6 to 6 and a half percent on fixed income or 5 and a half to 6 percent on fixed income and having maybe 20 30 percent and again it also depends on the size of the corpus uh, mubina so you know one needs to understand that and then accordingly you can go about investing but definitely like you rightly said you know savings bank is a very inefficient i mean savings bank i wouldn't even call it an investment i mean it's more money kept there for emergency purpose or liquidity which you can access any time as far as the stocks are concerned since i don't know which stocks are there and what kind of a portfolio he has i wouldn't be able to comment if he's a if he understands stock markets then my only advice is you know to keep it in very high quality uh stocks uh, so that because it's a retirement money he doesn't want too much volatility he doesn't want to lose money in any of the stocks so just keep it conservative or given give it to a good mutual fund manager so you know that would be my broad advice uh, to him all right okay well ashish uh, it was a pleasure having you with us today thank you so much for joining in on the money show um, helping out all of our viewers with their questions and queries and you know uh, solving this dilemma of sorts you know that uh, for all those people who are relying on provident fund is a great way you know to accumulate your retirement corpus thanks again okay well it's time for a very short break on the show uh, and when we return we'll be back we'll be back uh, to talk to abhishek bisin evp and fund manager fixed income with kotak mahindra